Good morning and welcome everybody to the um, uh, sort of next police uh, accountability meeting for Lincolnshire. Um, apologies, we're starting a few minutes late. Um, we will make a start as soon as I've got all the papers pulled up in front of me, which uh, is just proving elusive at the moment. Apologies. Here we go. OK, so have we got any apologies for today's meeting at all? Yes, we have, Commissioner. We've got apologies from Malcolm Birch, the Chief Executive. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, so uh, as is traditional, we should um, uh, do some introductions, but uh, we'll we'll keep these brief as ever so we can get on with uh, the meeting proper. But I think it's important people know who, who is attending the meeting today from uh, the officer point of view. Um, so I'm Mark Jones, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Lincolnshire. Um, and I'll pass over to you, Chief, uh, to make your introduction. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chris Howard, Chief Constable. Uh, shall I pass to Jason uh, and we'll wrap around that way. Jason, Karen, Chris, OK? Yeah, OK. Uh, Jason, are we in Deputy Chief Constable? Karen? Good morning, Karen Wilson, Assistant Chief Constable. Morning, everybody. Chris Davison, uh, Assistant Chief Constable. Thank you very much. Um, I have also on uh, here, I'm just going to go down the list for everybody. Um, Lucy. Yes, morning, everyone. Lucy Bogosowski, Head of Corporate Comms. Um, I've got Phil. Good morning, all. Phil Clark, Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, uh, Hannah. I'm Hannah and I'm an intern in the OPCC. Uh, and organising the event today to make sure we, we stay live. So thank you for that. Uh, Sophie. Morning, comes officer in the OPCC. Uh, Kelly. Morning, I'm Head of Strategic Development for Lincolnshire Police. Uh, Aubrey. Morning everybody, Aubrey Williams, Research and Performance for the Commission. Uh, Katie. I've not got Katie. OK, well, I think that that is everybody on the list there. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we will go straight into the uh, meeting proper. So um, uh, we'll go straight into uh, my update. The only thing I, I was going to say by way of an update today was that uh, obviously it's it's as ever a very busy time for policing but obviously there are a number of other challenges going on around the world which present some particular issues and challenges not just for our community but I'm, I'm obviously specifically concerned with our community and, and I think we're really clear that um, we want to make sure that from a policing perspective and from a public service point of view we want to support all members of our community so whether they're people that have got family overseas that are facing danger at the moment whether they are people uh, that are intending to bring uh, members of family over to our county from uh, from the ukraine uh, we obviously want to help support uh, you to make sure that you're safe you are well and that our community continues to flourish here in lincolnshire and i think it's really important that um, that message goes out to our communities that um, uh, we're there to help and support um, everybody uh, across our county. And, uh, you know, our thoughts are with people that are uh, experiencing difficulties currently uh, in Eastern Europe, but also those that have loved ones over there, friends, colleagues, whoever, because it is a really troubling time for people. So I didn't want to say anything more than that other than to say our, our thoughts are with you and uh, if there's obviously uh, professionally anything we can do to support and help then we are there as one community to help everybody that lives in Lincolnshire. Um, so if we move over to the public questions, Aubrey are you going to take us through this section? Yep, I um, have some questions for the Chief Constable submitted by members of the public and the first one is from a William Moffat of Metheringham and his question is about police visibility. 
my neighbours and I rarely see any police in our village. And as a result, the police are at risk of losing the confidence of the general public. How does the force intend increasing its visibility in local villages? Thank you, Aubrey. Thank you, Commissioner. So, uh, as you know, we're fully committed to ensuring our communities are supported and that uh, we remain accessible and visible to everybody. Um, we're going through one of the largest police officer recruitment processes that we've ever seen within Lincolnshire Police, and that uplift has enabled additional uh, police officers to be deployed into our uh, roads policing unit, rural crime action team, and into our neighbourhood policing teams in the past year, and we intend to keep doing that in the coming years as new new recruits arrive. It does take time to get people in and trained and through that process, um, but in terms of the Cliff Villages and Metheringham, there are dedicated community beat managers uh, in PC Matt Roberts and two police community support officers. Uh, and we've also increased our numbers of response officers across the county to provide 24 seven cover. So all of those teams, regardless of whether they're neighbourhood response, rural crime road policing, are about our visibility and accessibility, and they're all servicing and responding to incidents across our villages. But we have to deploy our resources against the highest areas of risk and demand, and, that, and that's to make sure that we get the best use of the finite resources available to us and that we get the best value from our limited budget. Um, we're always looking to recruit special constables and police staff volunteers to help with that um, visibility and accessibility and spread of our resources across the county. Uh, and there is information on our web pages about how people might be able to do that. Thank you, Chief. Just just before we go on to the next one, I think I think it, it, it's also fair to say that obviously one of the ongoing commitments that's been made as a result of uh, support by the public for council tax increases or is around additional community beat managers as well, which uh, is another. 12 across the county once that's in, in, in place. And I think that's an, so there is that ongoing commitment, as you say, um, at that strategic level to make sure that yeah. visibility is definitely happening. But I think one of, it's often a question that comes up in public meetings that I attend um, about how many police officers are serving any given local community. And it's quite difficult to sort of articulate beyond saying all of them. Um, because obviously if you have a, an incident in a, in a local area, it isn't just the officer that physically attends, but the entire weight of Lincolnshire Police that often will kick in behind that, whether it's to investigate the crime, it could be as part of the regional organised crime unit, it could be any number of officers that are all supporting every and all local community. And it's quite difficult um, to articulate just how many people are supporting that local community, but it, it, it it runs into the many hundreds rather than just into the officer that you might see in the local community. And I always think that's an important point to make. Thank you, Commissioner. So we'll move on to the second question, which is from a Ro Rowena Harrop of Gonaby Hill in, in Grantham. And her question is around electric scooters. What action is being taken towards those riding electric and motorised kick scooters in public places? I understand it to be illegal and at speeds as fast as a car, dangerous. OK, thank you again. Um, so there, there has been a lot of media coverage that we've released on various platforms to try and educate the public that e-scooters are illegal because um, there seems to be a bit of a, a, a misunderstanding about what you can and can't do with an e-scooter. And we're doing everything we can to dissuade people from purchasing them and then using them in a public space. Um, our neighbourhood policing teams have also been liaising with schools to get messages across and a number of them have them as neighbourhood priorities at the moment. Unfortunately, e-scooters can easily be purchased at various outlets with very little legislation around them. And even though the retailers should be informing customers they can't ride them in a public place, we don't think that, that message is getting across all of the time. Um, all of our officers are aware of the law surrounding e-scooters and we do ask them to exercise discretion and engage and educate in the first instant instance, but we're also looking to enforce where it's appropriate to do so and to seize e-scooters when necessary if, the, if we believe the law is being flouted. Um, we've seized several e-scooters in the last year and prosecuted riders for offences where it's been appropriate, but first and foremost, it's really about the engage, explain uh, and encourage people. Our local teams are continuing to do that 
and we think that that is the most appropriate and proportionate response at this time whilst people get to understand uh, the law around e-scooters. Um, since July 2020, the government has been trialling the use of e-scooters across the country. Um, Lincolnshire Police hasn't been part of that pilot. It was initially due to last for 12 months, but has been ex extended to March 2022. Uh, and the results will then be used to inform government policy and possibly legislative change if necessary. Um, we don't know whether that will be to regulate them or to ban their use and we'll wait and see on that. Um, so we are working on it. It is part of our neighbourhood priorities in some areas where it's been more prevalent um, and uh, the education piece is probably the most important piece to, to deal with at the moment. Thank you, Chief. Um, next question is from a Michael Brooks of Long Bennington in South Stephen, who's a retired police officer and a parish councillor and also a coordinator for Community Speed Watch. His question is around rural policing. We have a really good PCSO, Barbara Mooney, but when she is off, we don't seem to have any cover in the village. The villagers in Long Bennington and surrounding villages so that they pay the same amount of council tax for the police as residents in the town. When is the rural policing project going to start? OK, thank you. Um, very similar answer to question one and, uh, and the same uh, comment I'd make uh, that the commissioner made earlier is that council tax is paying for all of policing, not just neighbourhood teams. Uh, and that 24 seven response is part of our response to rural communities. Um, rural crime is a priority for us. It's been part of my strategy since I arrived here and the rural crime team is now being developed. Uh, we've got uh, four officers in that team at the moment and we expect to double that over the coming uh, few months. It's already been established uh, with those officers and has had an impact across communities uh, and we've seen some of the community, the rural community demand almost halved over the periods October through to uh, the current position but it does need more, more resource into it. And then using that additional resource across the force, we hope to support more problem solving with our communities. Um, we do recognise council tax payments affect all of our communities and we do deploy all of our resources uh, accordingly uh, and across the whole of the county. So it's, as I say, it's not just about the, the neighbourhood teams, it's about all of the resources at our disposal who will come and help and will respond to incidents. And that includes uh, a road policing unit that's being developed, which will help to tackle some of those speeding offences and road safety offences. But we do need to deploy against the highest areas of risk and harm, balanced with the ongoing commitment that we have with our neighbourhood teams. We need to be mindful that if we don't deal with those high areas of risk and harm, and if we don't stop them, then they will overspill and spread out into our villages and our, our rural communities uh, more prevalently than they might do at the moment. So it's a very fine balancing act with very finite resources. Thank you, uh, Chief. Um, and the final question is from um, Nikki Wilson and it's about stalking provision. Will Lincolnshire be following in Derbyshire's footsteps with regards to the new allocations and promises for dedicated stalking coordinators and service measures. OK, thank you. Um, uh, so in terms of what we're doing in Lincolnshire, the, the simple answer is we're not looking to adopt a coordinator for stalking within the force currently. And the reason for that is because we're going above and beyond that. Uh, we're looking to appoint a superintendent whose sole responsibility will be violence reduction and to de deliver force improvements around violence against women and girls. We've got an identified force tactical lead, a detective chief inspector who oversees the stalking portfolio already. We have an offender management unit who review and scrutinise stalking offences to ensure we're identifying any opportunities to obtain stalking protection orders. Uh, we're looking to appoint stalking specific points of contact within each policing area uh, to advise colleagues about how they're dealing with such crime types. Uh, and we're looking to train a number of people uh, around uh, how we deal with stalking and stalking prevention orders so we can standardise our approach to that. And to, uh, on top of that, we also have very good um, links into um, the independent domestic violence advisory services, IDVAS, uh, and external partners such as Paladin to understand the issues victims may face, particularly in relation to this issue. 
and we're working in conjunction with the new violence against women and girls delivery group to ensure we've got the voice of the victim at the heart of that and that we learn from from best practice regionally and nationally it is a force wide issue uh, and it is something we're taking seriously and we have put a number of measures in place to mitigate this um, but we don't believe that there's a requirement on top of what we've already put in for a full time stalking coordinator post because I think our structure is probably more robust and resilient than a single stalking coordinator post might give us. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much um, to the members of the public for the questions and uh, thank you, Chief, for the uh, very clear answers. Um, they're very helpful, particularly uh, the last one around the stalking um, uh, and harassment, because I know it is something that, uh, uh, you know, historically hasn't necessarily had the focus that it that it is now receiving nationally as well as locally. And it is something that I think is uh, of particular interest to a lot of people. So thank you for that really clear answer about where we're at in Lincolnshire, because I think I think we are in a uh, a good place. There is a good understanding, but the you know it's it's good to see that level of ongoing commitment to improve things further. Okay, so moving on. Next item, item five, the exceptions report around crime. So uh, over to you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> uh, I'll try and keep this uh, relatively short and sweet because we've got uh, a number of thematic reports that are going to be coming up later on around crime reduction, data integrity, contact management, the police officer uplift, rural policing, mental health, and the rural crime, uh, sorry, road policing and rural crime. Um, so a lot of the issues that we cover in this report are probably gonna pick, be picked up in those thematic ones. Um, but just going through <coughs> in terms of where we are and the strat before strategy, crime and antisocial behavior, we're showing a relatively flat position on crime at the moment. Um, so we're, we're kind of levelling out now post COVID, um, but there are some good good news stories around burglary, both residential and other. Um, <clears throat> we have got a slight uplift in our homicide levels as an exception point. Um, that's showing 16 murder stroke homicide or murder stroke manslaughter, which make up the homicide category. But six of those will probably get deleted uh, soon as we've we've now been able to prove that there was no suspicious, suspicious circumstances around those. So if I just take us through the, the overall report. Stop crime and antisocial behaviour, looking at all crime, as I say, is flattening out and is kind of levelling out where we expect to be uh, when we haven't got COVID and lockdown happening. Um, crime data integrity, as I say, and crime reduction will be part of the thematic report in a moment. Um, we have, uh, as we've just spoken about, a real um, effort going on and commitment around violence uh, and violence against the person, but specifically against women and girls. Um, and the homicides, as I mentioned, should come down to where we would expect our normal levels to be. Any single episode of a homicide is obviously a, a, a catastrophe, really, and not a good place to be. Um, but they're very isolated incidents, and we do work hard to try and make sure we educate people and prevent these where we can, but they're very, very small numbers uh, normally uh, around 10 or 11 across the year. Um, but otherwise, violence against the person seems to be kind of within normal bounds and normal tolerances. Um, looking at our neighbourhood crime, uh, I won't dwell on this because again, it will probably come into the thematic reports, um, but these are the, the crimes that the government wants us to uh, look at, so burglary, vehicle crime, robbery, um, burglary, as I say, is looking at a healthy reduction at the moment year on year um, at 17.5%. Vehicles, 6.5% down, but we are starting to see uh, as we as things return to normal, that uplift in theft of vehicles again, uh, and it's starting to take us outside of our normal tolerance levels that we've had for the past 18 months to two years and, and returning us to figures closer to three years ago. Um, but that's been largely down to a spate of uh, transit van thefts uh, over the past couple of months, and we've got an operation uh, around that at the moment. And we've also had a number of Land Rover defenders uh, stolen, uh, which appears to be uh, linked to some of the rural crime. And again, operations are in place to try and curb that and find the offenders. Um, 
yeah, I won't dwell on the uh, dashboard that shows our, our position nationally, but base, uh, the, the simple summary of that is we sit kind of mid table uh, and upper tier in quite a lot of those categories, which given our funding position uh, and the resource we have at our disposal, I think is a very healthy position to be. We are stable or rising in that position in about 65% of those categories. So things look like they're going in the right direction and we'll keep pushing those to get higher and higher uh, in order to achieve the, the, the vision, which is to be the safest place in the UK. Um, moving on, uh, and I have to apologise, I can't see the team screen. So if anybody wants to say anything, you'll have to shout at me and stop me talking. Um, so I, I can't see any hands up. Um, stop crime, antisocial behaviour, antisocial behaviour again, is coming down to where we would expect it to be post COVID. Um, figures show really sharp rises during the COVID period, particularly COVID related antisocial behaviour, but we're now back down to where we would expect to be. So significant decrease in the past 12 months, but really all that's saying is that we've gone back to where we would, we would expect our normal levels to be. Um, and one of the areas that I think is of concern to me, uh, and I think some of this is beyond our control is around our positive outcome rates. So if we look at our positive outcomes, it breaks down into two areas, those which go through the criminal justice process uh, and those which are out of court disposal. So penalty notices, cannabis warnings and community resolution. Uh, in our positive outcomes where it's charge, youth caution, adult caution, taking into consideration penalty notices. Again, uh, you can have cannabis and community resolutions going through that. Uh, we've seen a 30% reduction uh, over the previous 12 months uh, and in, our, in terms of our out of court disposal, 29% decrease over the previous 12 months. This is a point of interest for the performance board that the DCC is chairing. Some of it is down to the impact of criminal justice delays. Some of it is down to the impact of uh, things like new charging standards and the Attorney General and uh, DG guidance that came out uh, last year and the amount of work that now is required to try and get things through through to a charging decision um, and how much time that is taking. So the volume is definitely starting to have an impact on our ability to turn work around and that's a finding that's coming through some of the baseline work that we're doing at this point in time. Um, and that may, may be a thematic report to come to this, this board uh, and this meeting at a later point. If I just move us on then into protecting people from harm um, domestic abuse, uh, we've spoken a little bit about the, the stalking and harassment piece. We're starting to see our numbers uh, just starting to rise again after a sharp dip. Um, but we're, we're quite happy with that because actually these offences are the ones that we want people to be reporting. We want to see an increase in them because it tells, tells us that people have confidence uh, in where we're going. Um, uh, and at the moment we're showing a pretty much a static position year on year, but we, we do expect those numbers to start to rise, particularly as we do more on crime data integrity and more to encourage people to report and repeat victimisation in particular uh, is, is one area where we, we want better reporting on it. Um, but our DASH referrals, so domestic abuse safeguarding hub referrals to other agencies, 66% of our cases are going in. Uh, majority of those are children's services. Uh, and then a number going to partnership support and uh, third sector supports as well. Um, moving through very quickly, child sexual abuse, exploitation uh, and exploitation. We can see a rise, a steady rise in child sexual, ex uh, child sexual abuse, um, but a, uh, a decline in those where exploitation is seen at the same time. Again, this is, I think, a healthy position to see the rise in reporting. We know this is significantly underreported. We know it, it, a lot of it happens online. It's very difficult to identify. But to see that rise is an expected rise and it is a healthy position to be in because it gives us a better understanding of the risk that is there. Um, uh, it's interesting that the exploitation piece has dropped off over the last few months. Um, but they, at the moment, there's no understanding as to why that might be or whether it's just a change in, change in offending behaviour. Um, so <clears throat> that's just a, a position of note and something to, to watch over time. 
moving through to sexual offences, so I'm on slide 18 for those who are looking at them. Um, we're seeing a rise in reporting again here, which again, in my view as a Chief Constable, is a positive thing and we shouldn't be worried about this uh, because it, it again gives an indication that people are willing and have confidence to report to us and that we will take this seriously. And whilst any rape is uh, a nasty place to be, again, the more people uh, are confident to come forward and tell us what's happening, the better that position is um, because it gives us more opportunity to identify and uh, arrest the offenders and, and bring them to justice. Um, just a point of note, the first Lincolnshire Rape Scrutiny Panel was held in December uh, in 2021. That's working with partners to improve the investigation of rape cases and the services that we can offer to victims of rape. They will meet four times a year. It is independently chaired, so it's not chaired by the police. Uh, and during the first meeting, there were four rape investigations that were reviewed and an order to meet each investigation was completed as well as an order of the suspect and victim interviews. Those results were presented and have highlighted a number of areas of uh, of good practice, but a number of areas for learning as well. And we will continue to use that to improve the service that we can offer to uh, victims of rape and witnesses to that as well. And um, moving through then, the next part is about road safety. So I'm going to skip through that uh, because there is a, a piece on road policing later on. Um, but the stats are there in the slides uh, overall and um, pretty much on on number where we would expect them to be year on year and um, so i'll leave those to be to be read from uh, those who are interested in the figures protecting people from harm mental health section sec, uh, so slide 21 i know there's a thematic piece uh, on mental health later um but this remains a thorn in our side um, and we're seeing a continued increase in the number of people a number of incidents being reported to us 14 percent up year on year um, and the number of 136 section 136 detentions is going up as well the worry that i have around that is that in terms of the time spent waiting at a and e when we do uh, detain people under 136 or elsewhere uh, takes up a lot of officer time and that ranges from one hour and 30 minutes to at the worst case so far 17 hours and 50 minutes before our police officers are able to be released and leave that person either in the care of medical professionals or the person is uh, deemed fit to be returned home. The average waiting time spent in A&E with mental health 136 uh, detainees stroke patients is seven hours 22 minutes. That would in and normally be two police officers sitting with one person for the entirety of their shift. Um, so it's a significant drain on our resources and one that continues to, to cause us some real problems in terms of resourcing uh, and demand. Um, <clears throat> if I move on, because I'm sure that will be picked up in the thematic paper later, but if I move on, the next piece is about protecting from harm and public confidence. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on slide 22 because those are figures taken from the Habit 5 um, survey, which was part of the Police and Crime Panel presentation from the, the Commissioner yourself. Um, so you'll be aware of those numbers. Um, I suppose the one that we've got to look at is the disproportion, disproportionate fear of crime in Boston uh, compared to other areas. Uh, and that's something that's being picked up in our own strategic needs uh, assessment and uh, strategic risk assessment as we move forward. Um, the next slides are about call handling and public calls for service. There is a thematic paper on this on contact management, so I won't dwell on that one. Um, again, the figures are there and I'm sure Karen will pick this up as we go through. There is a significant amount of work going on and a recruitment programme going on at the moment. But as we come through the transition from our commercial partnership with G4S, uh, we do expect things to just be a little bit wobbly for a, a month or two while we make that transition, but should settle down fairly quickly thereafter. Uh, and likewise with response times, that will be picked up later. Um, user satisfaction, we're sitting at 72% overall satisfaction key area to look at here is 57 percent satisfied on being kept informed so that piece around keeping our victims informed about what's happening is is critical and the victim codes of practice um 
we are seeing a significant improvement in our timeliness and uh, making sure victims are kept updated as a result of the click business information and performance tools coming in and the dashboards coming in. And um, so we hope that over the next few months we'll start to see a, a, an upturn in that, that area of performance. Um, and then very quickly moving into the complaints element, we've seen a downturn in complaints, uh, which is good news, 10% reduction uh, in complaints in quarter three compared to quarter three of the previous year and an 11, but a, a, that's a, a, a turnaround in performance from where we were with an 11% increase in complaints for the year to date. Um, so we are working very hard on our standards of behaviour and the message that goes out uh, and the expectations. And there's been a lot of work around um, the values of the organisation, standards and uh, the culture of the organisation as well. Um, that then takes us into workforce levels, which again is probably going to be covered in the police officer uplift uh, element. The only pieces I'll pick up on here is really we've seen an, an increase in our sickness and absence levels uh, over the past few months. Uh, some of this obviously down to coronavirus. We're starting to see it kind of plateau out and just reduce again a little bit, but we'll monitor that one carefully. Um, and then we're seeing some slight anomalies with long term absences in uh, people who have only got naught to four years service um, <clears throat> and uh, also those with 15 to 19 years service has increased whereas the gap in the group in between the five to 14 years service we're not seeing that kind of long term absence so we're just monitoring those at the moment and the final piece on this is the COVID welfare cell uh, which has worked so so well over um, the COVID and lockdown period um, they've done a phenomenal job uh, in looking after our staff. Um, we've seen 1,800 in instances of isolation from our staff and officers, uh, 357 positive cases, uh, and that team have gone out of their way to look after our people to make sure the advice and guidance has been adhered to uh, and been coming in uh, uh, of their own volition, really, sometimes just to support people particularly those who are suffering badly from uh, COVID or are suffering with long COVID. Um, and that is a very flying visit through uh, the performance report uh, and the exception report because I'm conscious the thematic papers will cover it a bit more. Thank you very much, Chief. That was, that was really, really helpful and very clear. I'll do likewise. I'd, I don't want to be asking you questions around the areas we know that we're going to get further information on. So uh, we'll cover those off later. But there were a couple, couple of things really from me, um, one of which was really around the prevention agenda. Um, obviously, crime will ebb and flow in different areas and that will be a forever situation. What I'm really keen on is is constantly learning the lessons of to what's actually going on on the ground, how we can work together to prevent crime from happening in the community um, as we move forward. And those messages will need to change uh, as as things happen. Um, obviously, theft from vehicles, uh, theft of vehicles rather, is one of those which you alluded to, and in particular that there seemed to have been a, a particular kind of theft which um, was more of a commercial vehicle uh, situation and obviously people people uh, taking Land Rovers, etc. And I, I, I just wonder whether there's a piece for us to look at about how any early trends, any any indications of what's going on on the ground as it is happening, um, how we can work better together to actually get those early messages out to the public. So if we are seeing a spate of van thefts or tool thefts from vans or whatever it happens to be, um, how we can improve our systems to make sure that we're getting those messages out as quickly as possible to help the public understand what they can do better to protect themselves. And in particular, where we have what, what we would all, all know as the Hanoi kind of burglaries, where people are breaking into a property to take the keys, those kind of things where we, we know sometimes they ebb and flow a little bit, whether there's any messaging we can um, uh, get out at that early stage. So I suppose it's, it's do you do you think there's maybe a, a separate conversation for us to have around prevention, the more dynamic information flow to the public to to help um, prevent that crime happening, I suppose. Um, I'll give you a couple of things to think about while uh, I'm there so uh, so we can 
uh, we can be brief on time. But uh, as you mentioned about particularly domestic burglary, the, the numbers are going in the right direction. And actually it's something that historically Lincolnshire has performed very well on domestic burglary. And as, as much as if it happens to you, the statistics being low generally is of no comfort. Um, and I know you strive to, to um, uh, investigate and, and uh, uh, bring to book anybody that commits these kind of crimes. I suppose the question I would have is, do we have an indication as to why we think burglary might be heading in this direction, given we know during COVID it was much harder to break into domestic property because we were all at home more, whether that's a continuing feature or is there something else that we can uh, pin that down on? Um, I've got a couple of questions around workforce. I mean, I think this is really important for the public to understand that when we make announcements about wanting to recruit more, um, it's great, but it takes time to have an impact. And actually, in the very short term, it's actually a lot more work. You've got a lot of people that are going through a training regime and then they obviously have to be supported as they transition uh, on, on to going out into uh, uh, sort of more active service on on the streets. But I noticed that when we look at the chart figures, November through to now, the deployable officers number is actually decreasing. And I, I obviously understand that we have people leaving service and everything, but actually the overall numbers coming into the service is going up, um, which is a good picture for the longer term. But I think it's really important that we articulate to the public that the complexity of that, that just because we've got more people in the organisation doesn't necessarily mean day one that they're automatically all deployable. I'm particularly interested with how that connects to the absence being up. So in, in effect, we've got a rising picture on absence at the same time as our deployable numbers are lower now than they were in November. So although the future looks good from where we are, I think it's, I just wanted to highlight that pressure really that you're currently facing on that. And um, uh, one final question I'll give you because I'm trying to avoid the ones that are connected to thematic. On, I think it is a real step forward to have the uh, independent, um, independently chaired group looking at the rape cases. Um, if you could just uh, confirm how the four cases that they looked at were chosen. Are they, are they, you know, are they hand selected for a particular reason? Are they picked at random? How, how does that work? Because I think that that would be of interest to, for the public to understand. Thank you. OK, thanks, Commissioner. I'll try and cover all those points off. I'm sure my chief officer colleagues will probably jump in and help me where I, I may struggle. Um, so uh, if we talk about the messages and crime prevention, I, I think in terms of the vehicles and Hanoi and theft of uh, vehicles at the moment, wherever you've got a, a, a shortage in demand, you're going to see an increase in uh, crime. Uh, and we know that vehicles are so certainly second hand vehicles and commercial vehicles are very hard to come by at the moment. Uh, and that market is probably going to get worse, actually, when you look at some of the parts that come over from Ukraine um, and what that might mean. So uh, we think there will continue to be pressure on us from there. I know that Lucy and the team do a lot through our social media pages, pages and through our neighbourhood teams about crime prevention and messages uh, of how to keep your vehicle safe, how to keep your, your houses safe, and we'll continue to do that. Um, uh, but I agree there's probably a, a greater link that we can have here across police and the OPCC communication network and actually how we use our partnerships and, and the council as well um, to, to do some of that messaging. Uh, and it's something we're continually looking at. Um, and as we develop our website with single online home and things like that, hopefully that message will be easier to get out uh, and things will improve. Um, in terms of the drop in burglaries and why, why that's happening, some of it will undoubtedly be uh, COVID related. It will be a continuing uh, kind of trend that people have, you know, it's just kind of fallen out of fashion. People have found different ways to commit crime. Uh, a lot of it's gone more into the cyberspace and fraud um, and scams and things like that. So there's a, there's definitely a different pattern of behaving uh, and a different pattern of crime, which also then, you know, going back to some of the public questions, that's the balance that we have to strike between physically being on the street and actually how do we police the online and the virtual space as well, because people are 
as at much risk of harm there as they are uh, on the streets. And, and I would argue that actually when you look at child sexual abuse and sexual exploitation and things like that, there is a significantly higher risk of harm online uh, than there is on in the in the real world, shall we say. So that virtual world needs policing as well, and we do do that. But I think we'll only understand why that's dropping and whether it's a continuation of COVID or whether it's a, a, a long term drop off in burglary over the next six to, to 12 months. And we'll continue to monitor that and, and evaluate it. Um, workforce and deployable people. Uh, I think that, that is a significant challenge for us. As you know, we've got uh, we've just had two cohorts who passed passed out. They're now on the streets. It was a pleasure to go and see some of them on Thursday on their first day on patrol. Um, but whilst they're in their tutoring phase, they're not deployable. Um, they're not uh, independent patrol status at the moment, so they're still going through their training. So that's 60 officers that have come through who are still going through that phase. We've got two more cohorts starting uh, in the next month um, or by the end of this month. Sorry. So um, again, that's 60 officers on our books but they're not deployable. Uh, they're in training, uh, but we've got to pay for them. And that takes, uh, it will take the best part of a year before they come out onto the streets and are actually into that deployable stage. Does that have an impact on absence levels um, and sickness levels? I, I would think probably to some extent, I think more worryingly is the, the demand levels that are going up per officer. Uh, and some of the work that ACC Davison has been doing has been looking at that. Uh, and what we're seeing is that over the past two, three years, um, and certainly uh, since austerity kicked in and the number of officers, because our numbers dropped so low, that the workload per officer has gone up by uh, nearly, uh, sorry, uh, about 75%, not quite 100%. Um, so they're carrying 75% more work and more incidents than they ever used to. Um, and our utilisation rate of those officers is extremely high. Uh, and the consultancy team that are working on it have made it quite clear that they have never seen utilisation rate of officers at the level that we experience here in Lincolnshire, which again goes to the point of some of our funding issues and the number of officers that we have and our overall resilience, which is a point that you, you and I, Commissioner, keep making uh, to the Home Office uh, and those in charge of government funding. Um, <clears throat> so is there a link between the two? There probably is, but I think it's more to do with the, the austerity measures and the funding levels within the force itself. Um, and the rape cases, um, I'm not sure how they choose those. I'm not part of the panel. It, it is independent. I, I will have to defer to either uh, Karen or Chris as to how those are chosen and whoever may have sat on, on that board, but I would imagine that they are randomly selected um, <clears throat> and I would hope that they're done with the permission of the victim as well. Um, so, uh, Karen, over to you. Thanks, Chief. Um, just in relation to the, the rape scrutiny panel, um, they are independently um, chaired, as you know, and the panel are made up from a number of different partners. Um, the presentation of the four cases, the very first meeting that we had in December, was randomly selected um, just from our Crime Standards Bureau. And the officers who were investigating were then presenting the case to the panel and that feedback was, was sent through there. However, what we have learnt from that very first one is to be a little bit more thoughtful about the cases which are being presented. So the next meeting is on um, 22nd of March. And the four cases that we're looking at presenting there, although they will be randomly selected, they'll be selected from a particular category. So one of them will be looking at a spiking case. Um, one will be looking at domestic abuse or child sexual abuse. And then the other two cases will be randomly selected from where the, the higher volumes are. So um, Skegness area and the Lincoln area. So that's how we're going to, to choose them. But we're not actually just looking at the cases to say, is this a good case and can we present it? So that's not part of the consideration whatsoever. If we give you some assurances on that. Thank you. Thank you for that and, and uh, thank you for the uh, overall answers. Um, I've got uh, just two other things I wanted to raise, um, one of which is around the victims kept informed. Um, 
it's a difficult question this, but what do you think good looks like for for you and for Lincolnshire Police? Where are we aspiring to get to? I mean, obviously we want it to be as good as possible, but we know it's not where we want it to be. It hasn't been where we want it to be um, uh, in, in a long time, you know, predating um, your arrival, Chief, so I'm not I'm certainly not saying this is uh, has just happened on your watch, but it's what what does good look like? I think it's a really important thing to try and get our heads around, particularly in the context of where we are against other forces, etc. And we know there are other factors that Im impact on whether people feel happy with their case that are often external. Um, and I accept that, but it's understanding what, what the ambition is around that. And one final point, which is one that you more than likely have to come back to me on, which is around the um, uh, stalking protection orders. It would be useful to understand over the period of their existence, which isn't that long, um, how many we've um, actually used. Is it a growing number? You know, and I understand their ebb and flow, but is it a case of they're embedded and, and we're using them more readily now? So that'd be useful to have sight of, of that information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I know Karen's waiting to come in on. Uh, she is, yeah. Those, but the stalking protection orders, uh, we, we can certainly get that data. I think the, the other piece, I know there's a bit coming up about crime data integrity. It's very firmly linked into that. Um, so we are starting to get better at identifying stalking and harassment. That's part of the commitment we've got and the reason why we put those resources in. Uh, and hopefully that will then lead to more identification of where we can use SPOs. Um, uh, once we get that kind of re recording part right as well. Okay, uh, Karen. Thanks, Chief. Um, just in relation to um, the victims kept informed, um, as you know, we've had work going on for, for a number of years to try and get better at this and understand where we're falling down to make sure that our confidence and victim satisfaction is where we want to be. There used to be nationally um, sort of a, a league table so you could grade yourself as to where you were with other forces, but that stopped a few years ago. Um, but probably about um, the, the last time it was run, I think it was probably in about 2018, um, what good looked like was around about 80% of um, victims being satisfied with the follow up. Um, we've got the victim confidence um, broken down into a couple of different categories and follow ups only one of them. Um, and we're nowhere near where we need to be yet. But this is something that we'll be able to pick up with our new um, performance intelligence tool that the deputy has been leading on so that we can actually see where the patterns are, how we can give people the space and time to make sure that they get to speak to their victims as quickly as possible or within the particular time frames. There is a new victims code coming in um, soon, which we're working on to make sure we understand the nuances behind that so we can embed that in everyday policing um, and make sure that um, all of those different barriers to allow us to get to keep victims up, updated are removed. Some of that is due to the demand and as um, the Chief's already mentioned, the utilisation rate of our response officers in dealing with the daily demand often overshadows the, um, the not the desire but the ability to actually make those victims, um, make those contacts with those victims. So you've got an officer who will come on duty and the balance is go to this particular job and deal with today's um, job or ring your victim from last week and update them about what's happening. And they're the dilemmas that they have to face constantly. And we need to be able to, to free them up, to give them the space to be able to make those contacts um, with their victims because both of them are equally important. Thank you, Karen. Um, I did see a hand from Chris Davison, but it's gone down. I, 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 do you not need to come in on that? I was now, just going to make. I was just going to back up the point that uh, that Karen made there, but uh, just by way of context, um, for one of our response officers, if they worked a forty-hour week, which is um, which is unlikely, but if they worked a forty-hour week, they would be utilised for over thirty-six hours. Um, that doesn't include time for taking any breaks or eating. So that's that's the scale of challenge um, that, that Karen's talking about. No, thank you. And and it is a really important point that we, you know, as we move forward, we hope that we can get a better balance between all of these competing priorities. But um, I guess what what would be useful is to try and understand 
what what ultimately we're trying to achieve. I mean, accepting the limitations of what's available to currently make that happen. But it, it, it just, if anything, adds weight to our argument, particularly around the funding formula conversation about um, where we need to be to get to the right level. Because one of the challenges, I think, is that sometimes when, when we look at review of funding formula and other things, it's almost given that the baseline we're working from is an acceptable one, where I would I would be very clear that the baseline we're working from, from a funding point of view, is not an acceptable baseline that we're starting from. So any, any increases that may come from a funding formula change potentially are just getting us up to the acceptable level that um, we need to be at. Chief. Thanks, Commissioner. And it was just to support that and, and echo that position is I think the work that Chris is doing will give us that kind of baseline that says we need more and um, we can't continue as we are. And that funding, uh, the baseline uh, level that we've got at the moment isn't acceptable. The only way that could be acceptable is if we make some really harsh decisions about what we're going to stop doing. Um, because they're the choices that we, we will face if we're going to keep our workforce healthy and deployable and fit for fit for purpose. Uh, they're the harsh choices that will come up in the future. Um, we will have to do something to, to mitigate this in the in the short term. But the simple fact is the funding and the resource levels for Lincolnshire do not fit the demand profile. Thank you. OK, so moving on then to the next area and apologies, we are a little bit behind time, but I think the exceptions report warranted a little bit more time than uh, than we had allocated to it as we went through it. So um, under the key areas for improvement, uh, again, we'd sort of got two areas that we were going to look at under this, the crime reduction, including crime data integrity, which um, from a public point of view might not and immediately jump out as being clear what that means, but the way that the police record crime um, in, a, in a, an ethical way to make sure that the numbers that we all stand behind and say this is how much crime there is in Lincolnshire uh, is recorded correctly, and then public contact management, including confidence and satisfaction. Over to you. OK, thank you. I think the uh, crime data integrity um, Karen, have I got you leading on that one? Sorry, I couldn't I couldn't get off um, mute there. Um, I, I think the 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 debt might have um, something to add to that. Um, didn't want to drop a minute in case he didn't have. One. Um, <laughs> he nodded. I can cover, um, I'll cover the yeah. CDI, Karen. I'll cover the CDI. I'll hand over to you then. Thank you. So, so Commissioner, uh, colleagues, you'll be aware of the the uh, the journey that the force had around crime data integrity. You'll be aware of some of the challenges we had about two years ago, just under t just over two years ago, when our inspection came back um, as in inadequate. And since that time, we've done a significant amount of work, not just to improve uh, from that position, but importantly, again, with our workforce, to understand the importance of getting getting it right. Um, again, this goes back to if we don't record crime right. Firstly, we're not actually making informed decisions about how we respond to that crime. And the real risk is that the victim's not getting supported by the relevant support services that's available to support that individual as well. So we need to get this right. We recognise there's lots of conversations nationally about some bureaucracy, about reporting, about double reporting, etc. But the reality is it's really important our staff understand why this is important. And importantly, when we do get it um, right, that the victim gets the right support. So since uh, since our last public assurance meeting, again, we've done a number of audits uh, through our crime registrar um, over the last nine months, particularly it's shown we're on that journey again about making sure that we are recording crime correctly. Uh, and as the exception report highlights today, whilst we're we're seeing overall of a 90 percent, which for a, if it was inspected by a magistrate inspector, that'd be good. So we'd remain as good. Um, actually, we've still got some challenge where there's under recording in some areas. Now, for public reassurance, Majority of these areas are where we're not recording the linked offences. So recording a primary offence and um, particularly around domestic abuse. We know that's a particular area we've got to do more work with, but we're not necessarily getting every time is the stalking harassment, which is the some of the conduct issues related to that, that primary offence as well. So what we've done um, linked to the performance board over the last six months, there's an action plan that's been developed, a very detailed action plan looking at some national good practice. That action plan looks at about some of the learning that we had from our previous inspections and again where we had feedback from victims as well 
and importantly that map that plans a live plan which has been managed through the crime standards meeting and reports back to the performance board and certainly this last quarter you can see where we start to see improvements again where the the numbers of uh, crime data integrity uh, and the uh, requirements to record correctly is improving again and getting us back to where we want to be as a force that said there is a challenge still that challenge is that this is a continuous piece of work this is not one you can do a piece of work and move on because the reality is it links into making sure we're, we create, we're reducing some of the demand on our staff uh, Chris has touched on there Chris Davison's touched on there already about the workloads what we don't want to do is an officer has to record three separate crimes for one for one victim when actually we want to make sure there's a better way of doing that so we are doing some of that work already some of that work's already in play with our mobile technology but the reality is here we want to get we want to record it correctly because of all the issues that we need to do but the reality is we need to make sure our staff continue through CPD continue professional development to understand why why this is important and importantly how they can uh, record it better as well so the journey continues as I said it's being managed um, on a monthly basis through the uh, performance board and we are seeing uh, some continued improvements. The issue is we must continue that focus for all the reasons I've touched on already. So happy to have any questions on that, Commissioner. But that's an update on CDI. No, thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to ask you any questions on that today. I think I think it's one of those where we we have those reports, we have those the focus around that, and. You know it's important to understand that this is not something that uh, as exactly as you've said that we can sort of ask three or four questions on a, at a meeting and then it goes away it's something that we're going to need to continue to monitor over time so you know we'll continue to do that and obviously uh, uh, you know that that support is there to uh, help you get that right because it it does go to the heart of public confidence but exactly as you said it goes to the very heart of how we are clear to government about what our profile is around crime so that we can make the appropriate arguments for funding so uh, you know it's important for a number of reasons but happy to leave that there thank you did you want me to cover the confidence and satisfaction in the control room please yeah um so we've we've got um changes coming to the control room as you're aware with the transition of the G4S and as a result of that, that's giving us an opportunity to um, relook at our performance framework to ensure that we've got confidence and satisfaction very well built into there. We do have that in terms of um, the work that we've got going on at the moment and we see um, very high levels of confidence and satisfaction on that initial contact with the control room. The um, Habit 5 survey, which was referred to in the main report, we've looked at the, um, the, the negative com comments that came through on there, which link into the control room. There were 77 negative comments in there, and the majority of those were in relation to waiting time for 101 calls, which we know has been a problem for us over the last year or so. Um, over the last five years, call volume has gone up about 10% into the control room, and that's nationally, not just within Lincolnshire. And the majority of those calls go to 999s, that increase. So we've really concentrated hard on ensuring that the 999 call um, is answered as quickly as possible because that is the emergency that we need to get to. So recognising that the issue around 101s has been a problem for us. We have put some um, new processes in place over the last couple of months. We've got a new um, IT solution that we've been able to switch on. And certainly for January and February's figures, we've got a much better response to that. So our 999 calls are now being answered over 90% of the time within the 10 seconds. Um, it was 92% in January and 96% in February. And we did have 100% um, on Friday. So um, I was very, very pleased with, with that. Um, the 101 calls where we were dropping at some points to around about 20 to 30 percent being answered within 30 seconds um, has improved to between 52 percent in January and 55 percent in February. So again, that, that's much, much quicker and our switchboard answering time is at 80 percent. Um, having said all of that, the call handling time takes a lot longer 
these days because of the complexity of the calls which are coming in and we want to make sure that the call um, the journey for those callers who ring into the police is as smooth as possible so we're not just answering the phone and then taking a contact detail and then passing them on to somebody else because that's not giving them the best service so they will be on the phone a little bit longer while we get all of the detail but hopefully they don't have to be passed on to anybody else so that also adds time to um, the, the time it takes for call handlers to actually deal with the call. We've got a process called Thrive, which looks at the threat, harm, risk, vulnerability, evidential um, opportunities, which we go through in, in quite some detail with every single caller to make sure that we're not missing any risks there. And again, we dip sample those, our supervisors make sure that they listen into those um, calls so that they can assess them and monitor them. And we get a very, very high satisfaction rate from that. Um, hopefully, when we go forward with our new systems, when we've got them back in place, um, we will be able to see the confidence um, and the, the dissatisfaction of the one on one call handling time massively reduce. Um, we have been struggling to recruit um, from the labour market. The labour market's quite tight at the moment. We've had a, um, a recruitment intake in January. There's another one set for March. We normally get um, around about um, 15 to 20 people coming forward for each of those courses and we've only got six people on each of those courses at the moment. So there is a real dearth of, um, of applications and it's not just within policing. We see that across all of the different industries across Lincolnshire at the moment. Um, we so we've set another training course in for May, which we're out busy recruiting for at the moment. And again, that will help us put more staff in. We're going to embed those staff so we've got the right number going forward into the summer to make sure that we are call handling, but not just the call handling times. It's the quality of the call so that victims and calls callers for service get the best service that they can when they do ring us. Thank you. No, thank you for that. And I, I know the, the one of the challenges is there's so many moving parts in this space at the moment with the you know new systems coming on board, the change from um, the current staffing arrangements under an external partner, and obviously that's transferring to an in-house provision, which uh, again is something that uh, is being managed exceedingly efficiently and well. So thank you to everybody who is working across that piece of work. I think it, it, it's really easy to underestimate just how difficult such a large transition is not just in this space but across the whole organization um but um you know it is an area of high risk uh, and concern the the call handling area to make sure that the public can get through uh, in a timely fashion and obviously that um, exactly as you've said that they get a, a good quality of response when they do um there isn't an easy quick answer i'm not looking for one but what i am obviously looking to do is work with you to make sure that that, that, that longer term plan is there that we can work to get the investment right into this space to obviously provision the online world make sure people know that they can contact us in that space and that the provision around the quality of service is there for that as well as making sure that um, you know that longer term plan is there for people that do want to make those calls coming in. It's obviously one of those challenges where we've seen the nines go up in volume, 101 come slightly down in volume. And the initial question is always, is that because people are calling 999 instead of 101 because they're frustrated with the 101? We won't know that for sure, but over time we need to obviously have the confidence to say, well, we know the 101 is is where we want it to be so that we know that's less likely. But, um, you know, again, it's one of those that we need to just keep a, a watching brief on and, and keep um, working hard on. But I, I'm again not looking for an overnight solution to this very complex problem. Uh, Karen, you want to come back? Yeah, just just one quick thing and a shameless plug. Um, Single Online Home has um, is is going live this month on all of the different elements, which again will help um, dissipate some of that call volume that comes in. Certainly on one hundred ones, we know that people like to um, make contact digitally, so we've made those provisions available. So reporting things like um, car accidents, etc., will be able to be done online now. Intelligence um, and other antisocial behaviour, so low level reporting, which we would normally see on 101, will hopefully go on to that as well. Thank you. No, that, that, that is a really important point. And I guess as well, this is where 
Um, I'm sure there is a comms plan sitting behind that and um, it's just making sure that as many people across uh, our, our sort of communities of Lincolnshire understand these new and helpful ways of being able to report what they can report. Um, so that's something that obviously we're uh, keen to make sure that that lands. But I think it's it's one of those where it's difficult, isn't it, to land a message with a member of the public about how easy it is to contact the police when they might not have needed to for 20 years. Um, they might not need to until a, a week next Thursday. So why would they take notice of the new methods of contact until they actually need it? So it needs to be a continual and forever thing that we're giving out those comms messages. We can't sort of just have a, a two or three week push on that. And I know you know this, but um, you know, the, the, the support is there from my side to sort of help that. We obviously have the Safer Together team, which are working with our partners out in the community. Any joint messaging we can do to, to help support the community's understanding of those availabilities, uh, you know, we're happy to help. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, um, I'm just pulling up the next set of papers. Uh, okay, so we're moving on to the priority updates, um, which we have a number of the uplift program, roads policing, mental health um, uh, and rural crime. So I, I, we've obviously got the reports there. Um, so you by no means would I I'd be looking for you to go through them in detail, Chief, because we've we've obviously got the reports. We've read them. Anything you wish to highlight, um, by all means do so. I'll, I'll over to you. Okay, so the, the batting order here is going to be Jason with the uplift. Karen will pick up roads policing and then Chris will pick up the last two papers. So if I hand over to Jason, he'll, he'll start. Thanks, thanks Chief. And uh, in line with your, your point, Commissioner, I will keep this brief because I think we have touched on it as some of this has gone through the report. So we are on track in terms of our plan around the uplift. So again, in very much summary, we started off our baseline of 1020 uh, full time posts, police officer posts. By the end of the three year programme, we should be up to 1186 posts, which is a good news story for the public of Lincolnshire. The challenge is always we're through this. It's not just about recruiting new staff to, for the, to get the new posts, but it's also as we're recruiting the new staff, we're also replacing some, some staff that's leaving us on retirement to go to other things. So actually our recruitment plans are have to be more sophisticated than just looking at how do we get 166 people into the organisation. It's a lot more than that. It's just nearly double that, if I'm very honest, over the, over the three year cycle. The important bit is it's provided us opportunity to, to reflect in terms of our current target operating model. Have we got our resource in the right place? And whilst, as always, we should continue and continually review this as an annual basis linked into our force management uh, statement. But importantly, it does provide us capability with that new 166 to put more capacity into our rural crime, which Chris will touch on a bit later on. Our roads policing, which again has been, been spoken about, and again we'll talk about, Karen will talk about that a bit later. But just importantly, making sure we prop up, and it is some of this is propping up our frontline officers that are working too hard for the amount of time they've actually got available to themselves in terms of demand. So making sure our response officer numbers increase. Again, debate for the force with yourselves, I think over the next couple of years, is it still right? Do we need to do it differently? Um, the work around neighbourhood policing, fundamental bit about working with local communities to understand their needs and addressing them again where we've got our community beat managers. But recognising again, the chief touched on it earlier on, some of this is not so visible to the public, but it's actually just as much of, if not a greater risk. And again, the online threat through digital and importantly, paedophile uh, online investigations. We know those numbers have increased, continue to increase. and We need to make sure there's relevant resources to that as well. So we are making good traction. We're on track. The challenge for the force, which we must continue with, and again with your support, Commission around the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion team, is that we recognise the uplift provides an opportunity to be more representative of our communities. So again, there is a particular focus of making sure that we are a better uh, match across gender compared to our communities, making sure we've got more black, Asian and minority ethnic community representatives. And again, whilst our profile shows we are in line with the numbers, actually that's not a true reflection, if I'm very honest. It doesn't really mean we're diverse in thinking more diverse in terms of uh, representation as well, wider representation, but just importantly recognising again the benefits of people being able to speak second languages, particularly with some of our Eastern European communities, and also at the same time we recognise attracting people to the east of the coast because geographically uh, it can be challenging because people predominantly live on the west side and outside the county on the west side. Again, we've been a particular focus around them areas as well. So whilst analysis continues to make sure we're getting the best 
uh, out of the, the uplift opportunities that we are. And again, very happy to share that in the future meetings about what that's looking like. Are we achieving against our ambitions to be more re re representative? We are seeing some 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 green shoots in our, our recruitment, which is good, but importantly, the quality, diversity, inclusion team will help us to enhance that capability uh, to do more, not just for the next three years, but post three years. And again, recognising the quality, diversity, and inclusion, not just about representation, but it's about understanding communities better and particularly working with those communities that are probably less visible, uh, probably less voicing in with policing because of railway confidence or, or, or wider issues as well. So Uplift is, is working well. We do have a challenge. It's on the force risk register around the PQF. Um, again, you'll know the force position on that previously about our not saying we're not here to professionalise service. We're very much supportive of professionalising the service. Clearly, we need to support PQF. The challenges is the risk that it presents and, and, and for the force there is the unknowns around does it um, stop individuals joining us that would have joined through other lines of, of, of recruitment processes. So as you know, it's man, it is mandated across policing now that we will be moving towards the PQF. Debate still about the start time for that, but there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes at the minute to make sure we are match fit to be able to deal with that, recognising the issues that presents in terms of uh, re uh, attraction, recruitment, and then obviously retention as well. And also links into the bit we said earlier on about deployable resources, because the reality is they will be out of out of, uh, of the deployable um, system for a period of time longer because of what's required through PKF. So happy to take any questions around any of that, but again, on track, great opportunity to enhance our capability around our target operating model. That means a better benefit and more, more policing for the public of Lincolnshire. But the third bit is we're obviously preparing for PQF and the unknown around that as well. No, thank you. And um, we've obviously covered a number of the challenges um, that are faced, particularly around as you bring in a larger number of recruits, you obviously need a larger number of mentors for those recruits, and that equally has a knock on impact on the service that's immediately provided to the public. But nevertheless, in the longer term, we know it's of value, but it does present some challenges. And I think as we move forward, the obvious challenge is that your mentors become younger in service as well. Um, so it's it's an interesting predicament for policing, but in particular for smaller forces with lower numbers. When I say smaller forces, obviously we cover a larger geographical area, which adds another layer of complexity. Um, one of the challenges we've we've often faced in the past has not been around necessarily the recruitment of people from uh, a more diverse background, but the retention um, and the appropriateness of the support within the organisation to make sure that they've got um, their needs understood and then met to help them uh, flourish and feel that uh, this is a long term career for them. And I, I, I'm obviously um, interested to make sure that that's an area we're getting right as well, because you could do an awful lot of hard work recruiting people. But if we're not retaining those people, then it's a lot of wasted effort. Um, and uh, I know you're working hard on that, but I, I just some assurance really around the fact that the EDI team will be working on that side of it as well. Yeah, the will commissioner, so it's not just the, the traction, which is really important, uh, and the, re the recruitment, as you said, it's also the retention, it's also that develop the wider development piece as well at the same time. So that's part of it, but just as important is the understanding community, because again, if we understand communities, we look, understand communities, build confidence just within communities, particularly those that are less likely to have contact with the police, again, whether it's because of lack of confidence already or trust in policing, that in itself provides an opportunity around the attraction, uh, and in just as importantly, the issue around retention, because they feel valued, they represent the organisation and represent the community they're actually coming from as well. Yeah, and um, I know some people, um, and I see this across social media, question why there's a need to do this. Policing is policing. It should be for everybody. It doesn't matter whether um, you know your the officer turning up um, to help you with your issue is black or white or from a particular background. And and I think it totally utterly misses the point um, of what we're trying to achieve. And I want to be really really clear that I fully support the efforts, names and objectives that uh, as a chief officer team you, you have around this, because it is really important that we understand the things that we don't know we don't understand. And that's the that's the really difficult thing. You, you, you can operate in a particular way because that is your understanding. It's your perspective um, and we can't improve that without hearing other perspectives and without changing uh, some of the practices. So I, I, I fully endorse everything that you're doing with that and uh, will remain very supportive of that. The other area I just wanted to pick up on was around um, the uh, PQF. Um, one of the things that is, has been an advantage to us coming at the back end of introduction of the um, 
uh, PQF programme has been that we've got the advantage of being able to see how it's worked elsewhere, which ultimately I'd have to say with what we were calling for all along was to actually roll this out in, in a slower time to enable forces to really evaluate what was happening to then make informed decisions, um, both in the interests of the organisation, the public and for the spending of public money. What we have now got is that that to some degree that we can now see it um, and um, certainly from speaking directly to the, the leaders at the College of Policing, it's clear that there are some uh, degree models which are exceedingly academic, which to m my personal view, they miss the point, which is that they are there to equip officers with the wherewithal to be the best they can possibly be to serve the public. It isn't about an academic rigour, it's so much about recognising the skill set that officers have is at a degree level, which is a different thing. Um, and it's clear that some providers have really understood this and are really working with forces to make the degree less onerous from an academic point of view, but really work with them to understand, understand the skills and the importance of um, uh, the, the street craft really um, as part of that and one that was highlighted to me was the difference between um, two different ends and I won't mention the particular uh, organisations but that there could be as much as a 40,000 word difference between two different degree models in policing today. That simply can't stand as being right and uh, it's just really looking for some assurance that as we move forward the kind of model we were looking for, I would hope, would be the more practical side of things. But it's really to understand the thinking as we move into that space. Thank you. I can see the Chief's got his hand up as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's just to respond to that part, just to give you the assurance we are looking at that. We're, we're well aware of the difference between uh, the different degree profiles, I suppose, that different education providers give us. Um, uh, and Charlie Rimmer is working through that and looking at what the most pragmatic and practical course will be that reduces the abstraction time and maintains our presence on the street and actually does that <coughs> on the job learning rather than more of the background academic piece. There has to be the balance, but it has to be the right balance. And I think some some areas have maybe got that wrong at the moment. Um, but as you say, that's the advantage of coming in uh, a little bit late on it. No, thank you. Um, but I'm no, I'm nothing else. I want to ask on that. If we want to move on, that's great. Okay, shall I cover the roads policing paper then, um, Commissioner? So the paper's there for for everybody to see. So I'll just add um, what I can to it in terms of a little bit more additionality. Um, the objectives for our roads policing plan um, is about reducing the number of people who are killed or seriously injured in road traffic collisions. Um, with the ambition of having the safest roads in the UK. Also to make hostile, the roads a hostile environment for criminals and to reduce the risk to and from younger and older road users through education, engagement and enforcement. And we pick those two particular um, um, extremities of older and use all older and younger road users because of the data that we have where we see that their particular risks in this can be for, for those two categories of individuals. Um, there was a successful bid for an uplift in resources um, to establish a roads policing team. As you know, we haven't had a roads policing team for a number of years. Um, the roads policing has largely been um, and add on to our armed response vehicles and our response officers. So we've now got two sergeants and 18 PCs who will be joining the team. We've had the first 50% of them join in January and the second half of that team will join in um, July. And they will be spread across two different bases across the county, but they will cover the whole of the county. Um, the, the first area of um, in our objectives about um, killed and seriously injured road traffic collisions, um, you'll see that all collisions have gone up. However, fatals have gone down by 26, almost 27 percent year on year from last year. Um, and our assessment of that is um, the roads were fairly quiet last year compared to what they have been previously. So we didn't um, have as many 
um, people on the roads. So we were we were monitoring and equating ourselves to quieter roads. So yes, we will have seen um, those collisions going up. However, I am pleased to say that the levels of um, fails have come down significantly cut to, to where we had been previously. Um, so that's, that for me is a, a good news story. The offence types that we're um, looking at enforcing on um, have all gone up around dangerous driving, speeding and no seat belts. And that's all proactive um, work that we've been doing to get people out on the road and looking at those what we call the fatal fall um, areas in terms of use of mobile phone and drink and drug dri driving that has come down. Um, so hopefully that means messages are getting out there. Some of our communications are getting out there and people may well be taking more of a, um, a um, a pragmatic approach to their behaviours when they're driving. One of the initiatives that we launched last year was Operation SNAP um, and Operation SNAP allows for members of the public to upload their data, their dash cam data directly into the control room um, and then we can take enforcement action from that. We've had almost um, um, probably about a thousand submissions now on dash cam data. One of the things I just wanted to get across, especially to the, the audience here today, um, speeding is really difficult to prosecute on when it's dash cam data. And so there's potentially a level of expectation there. If somebody sends a, um, some footage in of a speeding driver going past them, that will be able to take some action um, because we're not there to calibrate the speed and make sure that we've got it legally tight if it goes to court, it's a difficult one to prosecute. But the, the majority of the ones that we have prosecuted, um, we've done 256 prosecutions so far, have been around um, things like dangerous driving and careless driving. So that's very easily captured when somebody's going over a white line, etc., and overtaking um, in a dangerous situation or around a bend, etc. We've been able to take some action against them. So thank you to the public who've been putting that in because it's been really um, phenomenal in terms of the response that we've had. Being able to take action, whether it's letters to those drivers or enforcement and prosecutions will hopefully um, change their behaviours and they will and, and get that message out to everybody else that there's eyes and ears everywhere now. So, so please drive responsibly. Um, our roads policing unit since January, I'll just give you a couple of headlines of what they've been up to since we've put them in place. Um, we've got over 180 traffic offence reports, um, which they've um, been responsible for, which are effectively tickets for um, for all of those fatal four offences. We've had 18 arrests, mainly for drink driving um, and other offences. 10 vehicles have been seized um, and we've also stop checked 30 lorries and made sure that their documents are all um, in accordance with um, the rules and regulations, making sure that HGVs, especially on our roads here across Lincolnshire with the, the tight roads that we have, are all very legal. Um, we've identified a number of hotspots um, where we have um, a disproportionate amount of accidents and we patrol those regularly and dealing with um, serious collisions and bike safe initiatives. We've also been into schools to make sure that we're in those secondary schools that we're getting messages across to make sure that um, the, the rest of our communities and our young people who are going to go into driving in the next few years also understand what the rules and regulations are. Um, so we also talk about e-scooters in, in those presentations as well. In terms of the disrupting um, criminality and making roads a hostile environment for criminals, um, in February we stopped um, four organised crime group members in a particular vehicle and as a result of that stop and its proactive intelligence led stop, we were able to disrupt um, their activities, they were arrested, there was a machete, imitation firearm, drugs, um, balaclavas, etc. in that vehicle. So they were clearly on their way to commit um, other offences. So we've safeguarded and we've taken those individuals off the road. Whenever we do stop criminals who are using vehicles on the road, then we also um, look to seize their vehicles to deny them any future opportunities to be able to do that. Um, we've had a number of other similar type offences across the last um, two months and that has been fantastic to see that the, the individuals who joined that team are really um, thriving and getting out there. They've got the vehicles um, that they need, they've got the equipment that they need. We're still going through some training um, matters for them just to get them up to speed with what they do need to do. 
So that's fantastic. Um, and the, the last area on the objectives about the, reducing the risk to younger and older road users um, through education, engagement and enforcement. One of the areas that we look at is op revoke, Operation Revoke, and that is looking at um, how do we identify people who might be at risk and make those referrals either to their GPs or to the DVLA. So we've got some close links through the Road Safety Partnership to make those referrals um, directly and we made 58 referrals in the last two, um, the last few months for drivers who may have medical conditions or who are drug users or alcohol users um, or alcohol dependent. So we made those referrals to the DVLA asking them to look at their licences with the potential to have those revoked. Um, we've taken action, they've taken action on 28 of those that we've put through, the other ones are still pending. Um, this all adds up to making sure that road users are as safe as possible um, for everybody across the whole of the county. I'm um, more than happy to talk about anything else um, on the report if you had any questions, Commissioner. Well, thank you for that. I, I, it is an area uh, that um, is a particular challenge. It's um, you know a huge road network, over 5,000 miles of road network, predominantly B and C road here in Lincolnshire, as you know, and keeping people um, safe relies on them keeping themselves safe and others safe. And I think you hit the nail on the head about changing behaviour. It's not about how many fines we can deliver. It's it's just trying to change behaviour. And we know that the community, I want to pay tribute to the people that are involved across the county involved in Community Speedwatch. I think that's hugely important in getting, you know, it's it's sort of that entire ethos around policing by with consent. It's sort of the public saying this is not okay in our community and actually we know it has a huge impact on changing people's behaviour um, and also one of the areas which we've not covered in in the report is around the safer roads team which um, are the specials that have, that have sort of worked in this area for some time now and we know they've had a huge positive impact and I, i'm sure that they will be uh, over the moon to be seeing um, regulars with um, a different level of capability joining uh, the fight to keep our roads safer um, uh, one, one which is more of a, a, a detail point for me on the actual report. It would be great if we could just publish something else on the report because obviously these are public reports. So if we can just amend it, it would be great because there's some really helpful charts in the report. Um, but for example, it says dangerous driving percentage charge from 2020 up 92 percent. It would be useful to understand the actual numbers um, because 92 percent of what it, it, it sort of needs that context, I think, to, to really mean anything to the public. So if we can add those numbers to the, the chart, I think that'd be really helpful to people. Um, and just a question really, which is around public concerns that often get raised. Um, and recently I've had correspondence uh, that's come in, particularly around car meets and public concern about large numbers of particularly modified cars, often um, that they perceive to be quite noisy cars, um, whether they've got tinted windows, whether they've got loud exhausts, etc. about the police having the right training and equipment to be able to monitor those kind of things. Um, and also about motorbikes as we're coming into the summer months that we know that certain parts of the county in particular become more attractive to that and whether you feel you've got the wherewithal to uh, support the community as, as we go into that that season. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, and the car meets, we, we do work very closely between our specialist operations teams and the neighbourhood policing teams to make sure that we've got a coordinated um, approach to this. We learn from best practice around the country um, because car meets are, um, are up and down the country to make sure that if there's any initiatives etc that other people are engaging with that work to make them as safe as possible then we do. We're not there just to ban car meets um, because this is this is um, something that younger people do want to engage in um, and largely they are very safe and very well attended by young people. Um, there will be some offences as there is with, with any type of um, public gathering that we need to be aware of and deal with and our teams are very aware of what their um, enforcement capabilities are. So in terms of loud exhausts or driving behaviour etc, they will engage with people but it's more about engagement and education as opposed to enforcement. Enforcement should be a last option there if we can make things safer. So we do share that, we've got um, 
good links with whoever the organisers are for particular meets so we know exactly what's coming up when and we've got the right resources in place to be able to deal with that. We've also um, joined in some um, national working group um, fairly recently with our specialist op team to look at different media outlets to engage with young people. Um, not for me, but TikTok, TikTok and Snapchat and things like that have been used very well elsewhere across the country. So we're just looking at um, other different mediums to be able to get out some of our positive messages um, and work with other businesses and partners such as um, car showrooms um, and other people who might want to get involved because it's not just about policing and the community it's all of us that need to make sure that young people are safe at these car meets um sorry just in relation to that was car meets what was the other one you mentioned commissioner um it was a, around bike safety as we move into the bike summer safety. and just yeah. making sure you you've yeah. got what you need there we have we have we've got very well established plans um, around bike safety and um, where the majority of the bike meets happen and the days and times that they happen. So again, that's working with our local um, PCSO specials, safe the roads teams um, and making sure that we've got the right people in the right place for that. And again, using that as an education piece. Thank you. Thank you. Um, happy to move on. I think it's me then on mental health. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, just for any members of the public that are watching or will watch the recording, um, you may be asking yourself why mental health is a matter for the police. Um, in Lord Adebowale's report, he reckoned about 25% of all police demand was related to mental ill health. But more importantly, um, we've got statutory roles to play. So the main piece of legislation is the Mental Health Act 1983 that governs uh, police use of powers. And actually, there are some powers which only police can use, such as Section 135, which is um, uh, executing a warrant for the purpose of an assessment. Um, and you'll hear Section 136 spoken about uh, at times. Section 136 of the Mental Health Act is the power for a constable to detain a person where it is likely that they will um, cause themselves or others significant harm uh, in a public place. And for the purposes of the Act, uh, as it's been revised, that means any um, place that isn't, an, a, isn't a, a private residence. And the Capacity Act 2005. Um, you've already heard um, from Chief Constable that there's a, there's a rise for our services, and I'll come on to that uh, momentarily. But there have been some significant developments in the last six to 12 months. Um, and we work very closely with a number of partners across the NHS, um, including uh, the Lincolnshire Partnership Foundation Trust, LPFT, who are the, um, the body commissioned to do most of the mental health health work for the county. One of the most important things uh, that we've, we've managed to get together are help lines for police uh, partners and the public. Uh, which are available 24-7. So there's a mental health helpline for adults, the mental health advisory uh, professionals helpline, but also uh, really importantly, uh, information for children and carers uh, called Here For You, a helpline for advice when dealing with young people. It's just been a gap in our provision across the county for a long time. I'm really, really grateful uh, to the Office of Police and uh, Crime Commissioner uh, uh, who helped us with LPFT continue a mental health practitioner who sits within our force control room uh, and gives advice to officers and staff in relation to incidents including uh, mental health. That advice and guidance is available to uh, till 10, seven days a week. And we also uh, work with LPFT who provides what they call two crisis vehicular response cars who at the same time can be deployed uh, by the force control room mental health practitioner two incidents so that we can have face to face um, health care assistance where required. Um, we've had an ambitious package of training for officers that includes um, mental health law and mental capacity legislation, as well as mental health first aid training. And that continues to be rolled out across the force uh, for all staff. Um, so in terms of our performance, the mental health practitioners involved in 
2010 incident uh, from April to December uh, of last year, which is comparable to the same period. Um, although we have had some periods where that practitioner wasn't available due to COVID sickness. So our Section 136 Mental Health Act emergency powers have seen a 19% increase uh, with 486 detentions for the period uh, April to December 2021. Uh, uh, sorry, in 2020, and that rose to 579 in 2021. Uh, and that's really because um, a lot of people have suffered um, uh, quite drastically through the COVID pandemic and all the anxiety that it's caused and have found it difficult to get access to early healthcare. That means that uh, we uh, and uh, partners across the system are seeing uh, an, an increase in demand for services. This really impacts on the police in a couple of ways. First, as the constable has already spoken about, is waiting time uh, and waiting time in accident emergency because the places of safety for people detained with Section 136 are full. Um, accident emergency, uh, perhaps a little counterintuitively, is not the best place for uh, people experiencing mental health crisis to be um, to be detained uh, pending uh, their assessment. They're really incredibly busy places. Um, the staff there. Uh, tend not to be trained in mental ill health and actually um, they can be quite distressing places not just for the patient but also uh, for the other people waiting. So in terms of uh, the next six to 12 months uh, and our development um, we've actually um, rolled out with LPFT um, essentially a psychiatric a and &E at the Peter Hodgson Centre at Lincoln uh, which is now available for staff so that um, when we um, are detaining someone under Section 136 and await uh, assessment, they can be um, detained in a more suitable environment with better medical care nearby. And we continue to lobby for more places for Section 136, and in particular, um, supporting our PFT with their plans for the facility at Boston at the Norton Lees site, to make sure that there's a, a second Section 136 health based place of safety which is available for the east of the county. We continue our mental health training provision for officers and staff, uh, and we continue to work very closely, in particular with LPFT, to influence their commissioning and service design, um, essentially with the view that we want to make sure that patients get the very best treatment that they can, but also that we appropriately reduce demand on police services. Um, we have uh, ongoing issues of secure conveyance. So um, the guidance is very clear that conveyance where possible should be undertaken by an ambulance and not in a police vehicle. Uh, we continue to try and work with EMAS to influence that and LPFT, to make sure there are properly commissioned services. Um, we continue to work with LPFT on um, diversionary schemes and we're rolling out uh, what are called crisis cafes. So these are out of hours premises uh, where people can go when they're in distress pre-crisis. Uh, across the county. Um, we're making linkages between um, health locality teams and our neighbourhood teams so that we can um, uh, deal with people who are often calling both services and making sure that they've got the care they need wrapped around them to re appropriately reduce the demand. So in terms of our exceptions, opportunities and risks moving ahead, um, there is the ongoing risk of the abstraction of officers dealing with incidents as those numbers uh, continue to rise. Uh, and we try to mitigate this by working closely with LPFT so that they understand the pressure on policing and the role of policing. But also we develop uh, relationships uh, with other partners such as the new clinical commissioning group Mental Health Lead uh, who has recently uh, arrived in Lincolnshire. Um, so our key message is really to the public in terms of uh, mental ill health and policing. We will always respond to safeguard and support those uh, people in need, uh, particularly who are undergoing crisis where police powers are required. We continue to work with partners to maintain and develop relationships, ultimately with the view that we get the very best care we can for those people in crisis and to minimise police contact with people uh, experiencing mental ill health issues up until this point. Thank you, Commissioner. Available for any questions. No, thank you. And uh, I, yeah, I I know you share this concern, but I remain concerned that um, what people in a, any health crisis need is not the police. Um, and, um, you know, it's the same up and down the country that, quite frankly, if you can't get hold of the service you need, the service you call is the police. 
and whether that's about social care, whether that's about mental health, that's the challenge. And I know LPFT are a really good partner. They they work really hard uh, on behalf of the people of Lincolnshire. So by no means am I suggesting that that they are not working hard to resolve this. The, the reality is it's the same thing that Lincolnshire's funding for public services is stretched beyond breaking and it puts pressures on everybody and the ultimate people that lose out are the members of, of our community. Um, so I know we're working hard with LPFT to try and get this right. I suppose the key area uh, of concern for me is still around the amount of time police officers are spending, um, which as we've said is not helpful to the individuals concerned um, that they're trying to help. Um, sat in A&E, um, and other settings. I mean, up to 17 hours is clearly ridiculous. An average of seven hours, so a full shift being lost there. And let's be clear, if an officer's four or five hours into their shift and then spending seven hours in A&E, they've gone well past the time they should have completed their shift and gone home for rest ahead of coming back again tomorrow. So it isn't as simple as their shift. It's often beyond their shift that they're spending in these, these environments. And ultimately, the member of the public isn't getting better health care as a result and it's how we resolve that and I, I appreciate we're working with uh, with them over uh, supporting their plans for additional provision which clearly happy to do. Um, the transportation issue has been a long-standing one and I suppose the question I'd have is do you believe any progress has been made in that respect because there, as far as I'm aware there isn't any bespoke provision uh, for transportation unless that has changed. Um, so, uh, in direct answer to that, no, uh, I don't think it really has changed. We've continued uh, to discuss the issue at all the appropriate meetings with EMAS. EMAS, as you know, have their um, own pressures, which which go uh, much wider than mental ill health. And um, there are some um, private providers, um, and we have uh, who are based in Lincolnshire, um, that we have. Um, pointed in the direction of commissioners and vice versa. Um, but to my knowledge, um, that is not something that's currently being taken forward, although we do continue to make the case. Uh, and just in, in terms of your point, it, it's really, really well made in terms of the waiting. We calculated the, um, the overall cost for the last year's waiting time for police officers, um, which translates to with on costs, the price of two new police constables. Um, and therefore, uh, where I make the point uh, to my colleagues in other sectors about the provision of mental ill health, uh, places of safety in particular, um, I try and uh, I try and point out more than one approach. So the first one is clearly that to only have two places of safety for Lincolnshire, given the 19% rise in crisis, uh, is a failure of commissioning uh, and the funding formula, as you, as you quite rightly say, and very bad for patients, um, but it's not going to affect on policing and our mission to make Lincolnshire as safe as it can be is really clear. That's two constables um, that that worth of um, work for an entire year that, that's been taken up just sat with people who are unwell. No, no, that's a really stark point well made. I mean, it's obviously a challenge as well, the sheer size and scale of Lincolnshire. So if you get officers who need to travel from Skegness to Lincoln, from Grantham to Lincoln, Gainsborough to Lincoln, um, with people who are in crisis um, from a health perspective, that clearly takes those officers from the community that they were serving. And, and as we know, quite often, particularly if it's the middle of the night, there won't be that many officers available in that particular location and it, it makes it all the harder for the community to get the policing they deserve. Um, one, one point, uh, and again, I understand EMASH's challenges and I support them um, in, in their endeavours. I do believe the current situation around provision is unacceptable. It's been going on for far too long and I don't think sufficient efforts are being made to resolve this problem and I, I'm not suggesting that you're not putting in sufficient effort, don't, don't get me wrong, but I do believe the system around providing the right um, ambulance provision is not delivering what it needs to do and I will undertake and I'm sure the, 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 the chief would, uh, uh, I hope the chief will, will add his signature to this, I'll be contacting EMAS to make this point in the strongest possible terms that 
we need to find a solution to this. It's not appropriate that police vehicles are being used um, to transport people in mental crisis. This adds to their crisis, it adds to their trauma and it takes policing away from its core mission. And I'm not suggesting EMAS have an easy uh, funded solution to this, but I'll be honest, the bottom line is it is for them to find a solution with their commissioning uh, bodies. It isn't for policing to continue year after year after year to fill that health gap and we need to find a solution. So I, I will take that away as an action that we will do that. Um, but thank you for that. I mean, there is a, a clearly a growing concern as to what the pandemic will have done to certain sectors of our community, whether what how that will manifest from a mental health perspective. Um, and I do think as a set of partners, we need to be alive to that in Lincolnshire and how we can work together to best support our communities. But it it's not about shunting our demand onto other providers, but it equally needs to be not them punting their demand onto us either. So we need to have some some robust discussions, I think, moving forward. But thank you for that. Um, we just have one more report, I believe. Yes, um, and uh, it, it's a, a, a double show of Davison, I'm afraid. So it's me again for rural policing. Um, <clears throat> so um, again, for the benefit of members of the public, um, just a little context for us. Um, Lincolnshire is, uh, as you will all know, a really truly rural county. Uh, and so therefore rural policing is a core function uh, for all of our staff. Uh, our neighbourhood teams and response officers are, are supported by specialist officers and we in this course have specially trained wildlife crime officers. In terms of our partnership work, um, we engage with representatives from local and national partners and non-exhaustively we talk frequently with the National Farmers Union, Country Land and Business Association, um, county and district councils, the League Against Cruel Supports uh, and, and uh, many of these and more uh, representatives, for instance, uh, regarding heritage crime, meet through our Rural Community Safety Goal Group. Um, we've got an identified chief inspector with a real interest and passion for rural crime and he also commits to meet, meeting local groups where possible. So um, I chair the Rural Community Safety Goal Group uh, and maintain the overview of all issues which impact on our rural community safety. So uh, the community safety plan, uh, the rural community safety plan is published uh, and we have seven aims which are aligned to the, the force priorities. So for stop crime and criminals, we target offenders causing the greatest harm to rural communities. Um, for instance, reducing Operation Galileo hair coursing incidents, reduce theft of plants and farm equipment and reduce arson offences. Uh, we protect our heritage, wildlife and environment uh, with reduced heritage crime, especially theft of metal, uh, reducing wildlife crime and reducing fly tipping and helping those in need, particularly reduce repeat victims of domestic abuse and increasing perpetrators brought to justice. So over the last six to 12 months, I'm really um, pleased to announce uh, that we've uh, rolled out the Rural Crime Action Team. Um, so that's a really exciting development for us. It has a sergeant and eight constables. Um, we've recruited four of those constables with the rest to be recruited um, by uh, by the, the time the summer season arrives. Uh, and that team um, really importantly has a real mix of skills. And so recruiting officers with obviously a passion for tackling rural and wildlife crime and uh, I'm really proud to say that we've been oversubscribed in terms of people expressing an interest on being on that team. But well, really importantly, um, also having um, trained detectives and experienced investigators uh, for reasons which will become clear. So um, in terms of our current position and performance, uh, we are the lead force for tackling hair coursing through Operation Galileo, which now encompasses 32 forces. Um, and we are uh, in constant dialogue with those forces sharing best practice. Um, our enforcement activity during COVID restrictions included the use of COVID specific powers, uh, although it was noted that the volume of offending nationally increased throughout the season to COVID part. There are no centrally collated figures for air coursing across the country, um, but all Galileo forces reported an increase in offending and enforcement. For the period of September to December uh, 2020, 
we had 1,331 incidents reported for boys compared to 994 for the same period this season. Um, but of note, in the Queen's speech 2021, a government committed to strengthen the powers available to police in courts to tackle hair coursing. Uh, and amendments to uh, the Police, Crime, Courts and Sentencing Bill are passing through Parliament and they're anticipated to receive royal assent prior to the start of the next season in September 22. Detail of those proposed powers have been prepared with DEFRA, but really heavily influenced by um, the, the work, drive and passion of Chief Inspector Phil Vickers on behalf of the 32 Operation Galileo forces. Um, in terms of our redu reducing theft of plant or farm equipment, um, work by the National Vehicle Crime Intelligence Service, uh, NAVSIS, anticipated the move towards the, the theft of smaller, more portable items. So rather than um, large items of plant and farm equipment being stolen, um, we also found that we were getting uh, things like high value GPS equipment theft reported. So ripped from um, external mountains within camps of uh, agricultural uh, vehicles. We investigated, recovered a large number of those, although some still continue to surface well abroad. Um, and it just highlights that rural crime uh, is highly organised and increasingly sophisticated, hence the requirement for detectives built within the RCAT team to bring these offenders to justice. In terms of the reduced arson offences, um, Lincolnshire Fire and Rescue are the lead partner for arson prevention, as you might expect, uh, but we work very closely with them. Um, we work with other agencies to reduce arson. We ensure a targeted response to vehicle fires, antisocial behaviour and rural arson. We raise public awareness. Um, we provide in intervention training and we record, analyse and share data to assist in arson reduction. We also pr provide um, arson reduction uh, guidance, which you can find on the Lincolnshire.gov.uk website. Um, and the volume of arson offences in Lincolnshire has been very low. Uh, but we, we stand ready to respond should they rise. Um, reduced heritage crime and specifically theft of metal. Um, I, I want to blow our trumpets slightly here. In, in particular, innovative work from us as part of Operation History, Operation Dastardly. These were two investigations of theft of metal from churches and heritage sites. Um, and use of technology by our uh, Force Crime Reduction Task Advisor was key in identifying offenders which ultimately led to a number of convictions through operation history. And it's led uh, the organisation English Heritage to invest in our innovation and learning and do a research package based on how we came uh, to this great success. In terms of reduced wildlife crime, um, we have those full-time uh, WCOs, wildlife crime officers, um, and a further 36 local police officers and PCSAs with the hands training to deal with the offences. Uh, Nick Willey, who's our um, dedicated wildlife crime officer, awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021 by the World Wildlife Fund for his dedicated, committed and innovative approach to conservation and enforcement. Um, and uh, DC Aaron Flint chairs the National Badger Persecution Priority Delivery Group with Phil Vickers as the National Lead on Hair Coursing. So Lincolnshire Police very much at the forefront of reducing wildlife crime. In terms of fly tipping, which I know is an issue for many of our rural communities, we work very closely uh, with our colleagues across the county. Um, we've introduced uh, the Environmental Crime Partnership for Lincolnshire, uh, which was formed in 2000 uh, and introduced Operation Asgard, uh, which is uh, an operation where offenders are pursued, vehicle seized for forfeiture or destruction. But we also have proactive activity through Operation Clean Sweep, which is intelligence led and targeted days of action, which we run between ourselves, uh, the ECP, the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency, uh, HMRC, which often results in multiple vehicle seizures, prohibition notices and preventing large quantities of waste from being illegally deposited. In terms of our um, repeated uh, victims of domestic abuse, increased perpetrators brought to justice, uh, it, it's a well-known um, fact proved by research that um, domestic abuse in more rural settings can be more hidden and therefore more dangerous. Uh, and we supported the production of the National Rural Crime Network report into domestic abuse in rural locations, which you can find at www.ruralabuse.co.uk. Recognition of the report, the RCAT are tasked with the preventive approach and awareness working. So we take every opportunity to raise awareness and empower third party reporting on domestic abuse in rural communities. So if you're, uh, for instance, the trusted 
neighborhood hairdresser or you run the corner shop and you're able to spot the signs we uh, help raise the awareness and also um, give information about reporting routes the next six to 12 months we uh, look very much forward to developing the RCAT skills uh, bridge capability to deliver against our priorities and continue to lead on the 32 Operation Galileo forces, including coordinated of new powers, the sharing of information, analysis and data and targeting of key offenders as the hair coursing season starts. Um, so in terms of opportunities and risks moving forward, um, uh, one of our primary ones is the rapid expansion of uh, the rural community uh, action team. Uh, the RCAT uh, and our intention to continue to provide enhanced training to local officers in wildlife crime and some of the specialist skills uh, such as stolen plant and vehicle identification. Um, having played a key role in helping develop uh, some of the new legislation around hair coursing, coordinating that with the use of powers nationally, making sure that we've got a consistent approach across forces, for instance, in the seizure of dogs, uh, to make sure that uh, a key asset from offenders is seized every chance that we get. Um, and also sharing the learning from our heritage crime investigations an opportunity to identify series of offences earlier, uh, identify vulnerable locations and make sure that preventative measures are put in place. So our, our, our key messages to the public, firstly, in case of hair coursing, we're still finding people calling us on 101 and, and we're always grateful for their calls. We would prefer if hair coursing is occurring that that was a call on 999. Um, hair courses often are, are in place for a very short period of time before they disappear, particularly when police officers are called. So the earlier you can call us, the better chance we've got of catching them. Um, the second is around uh, taking steps to secure your trailers uh, and agricultural equipment. Uh, as we've already heard, we've had a, a series of offences around Land Rovers uh, that remain a target of criminals um, due to their poor security in parts. So via our partners, uh, we roll out all the uh, key prevention uh, information uh, about how to secure and keep your equipment safe. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have to give that uh, information out, but we do, and we use the uh, hashtag lock up your landy on social media across all channels if you want the latest uh, advice and guidance there. And then finally, on the confidential and effective support available to anyone subject to domestic abuse across Lincolnshire, um, we have uh, on the Linked Police UK website uh, under reporting advice for domestic abuse. We offer advice not only to victims, but also for perpetrators who are recognising their offending and seek to change about how they can go about that. And for all information and guidance based on our approach to wildlife and rural crime, again, on the Links Police UK website, under reporting advice, we've got a section saying wildlife and uh, rural crime that gives all the key information. Thanks, Commissioner. No, thank you for that. And that was really comprehensive and uh, saves me asking you a number of questions. You'll be glad to know. Um, I, th I think what is really important and comes across very loudly is just the sheer breadth of challenges rural communities face. Um, they often are very uh, not very different from any other community in the sense that, that lots of um, what are called universal crimes will happen there as much as they will anywhere else, but they have the additional challenges of, of um, isolation, rurality, often making them a target for certain kinds of criminals. And I think that's where um, the innovation that the force has been able to bring to bear, both in, in putting forward the rural crime team, but also the roads crime team to help prevent that traveling criminality is really, really useful. Um, and I know that there are a number of initiatives that we're working on collectively around innovations in technology to help support our rural community further, which um, obviously for various confidential confidentiality reasons, we don't want to, to lay bare at this point, but it's good to see that we're, we're constantly looking to move things forward. Um, and I'm sure there'll be um, many community meetings that we, we will attend uh, talking to the rural community about their concerns, but also being able to give them some, some knowledge and insight into what's actually going on. And in particular, one of the things that I think is really important is around heritage crime. It's something that often does get overlooked and it can it can be very um, challenging for a community that hasn't got much by way of facilities if they get targeted for something such as the lead on the church roof, for example, um, which has stood there for hundreds of years and really speaks to the identity of uh, that community and then to get it attacked in such a way. And Lincolnshire has been at the forefront of challenging 
uh, some of these very organised gangs that have travelled up and down the country to target our community. So, uh, you know, it is gratifying to see that that, that investment continues. Um, but I'll not ask you any further questions on it. Um, I think we're in a, a good place with where we've got to and where we're going. I'm sure we will all agree there's always more we can do, but with the investments and uh, uh, not just in financial terms, but in in um, uh, making it a priority and making sure that, that people have the training and knowledge of what to look for is really helpful. So thank you very much for your efforts with that. And again, just, just to say congratulations to Nick uh, on his Lifetime Achievement Award. That's brilliant news. Um, and I know that Phil Vickers has worked exceedingly hard trying to corral um, forces around the country around what is not just a Lincolnshire problem but uh, a national one um, and has worked really hard to get um, the, the right people to hear um, that collective voice nationally so we should see those changes in legislation coming through. Okay so um, if we moving on from there that concludes uh, today's reports. Um, I am just double checking that I've forgotten nothing on the agenda but um, I believe that is uh, everything covered off. I'm just going to double check. So it just finally before we close the meeting, just to ask Aubrey, can you confirm when the next meeting is, please, Aubrey? It's on the 30th of May, Commissioner. Thank you very much. So we'll see everybody again on the 30th of May. Any final comments, Chief, that you want to make before we conclude? No, thank you, Commissioner. OK, well, thank you very much uh, for everybody's attendance today and uh, that concludes today's meeting. Thank you.